Hello and welcome to this week's online talk from St John's Church in Highbridge. Let us pray. Eternal God, our beginning and our end, bring us with the whole creation to your glory, hidden through past ages and made known in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, today's Gospel reading comes from John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, and it's the familiar, uh, to many of us I'm sure, story of the wedding at Cana, where Jesus changes water into wine. And the reading ends like this. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, at Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. What is it that makes us believe in a great leader? That's the question that's been on my mind this week, and I wonder why. I left it pretty late to write my sermon this week, partly because I was waiting to see whether we would still have a Prime Minister. Now, the phrase that has been used in relation to Boris Johnson this week is a lack of moral authority. How can Boris and his staff make demands of ordinary people that they are not willing to follow themselves? I'm sure you saw um, Boris Johnson's apology and it did seem genuinely penitent. But for many of us, it was too little too late. And he has always had, it seems to me, a troublingly blasé approach to dealing with criticism. You express regret, point out the good stuff you've been doing, and then hope the news cycle moves on before your position is seriously threatened. Now, whether Boris Johnson can survive much longer as PM, who knows? But more important than the survival of an individual career is the survival of trust in our institutions. Contrary to popular cynicism, there are many people in politics who are basically honest and some who are truly exemplary human beings. And of course, most people aren't heroes or villains at all. They're just flawed people doing their best. So why then is there this apparent moral gulf between what we expect of our leaders and how they actually seem to behave? Well, what you'd expect me to say is that it's because they've forgotten all about God. In a godless society, there's no sense of universal values, no sense that we are all accountable to anything much at all. So what's left is a kind of political Darwinism, the survival of the fittest. But actually, I think that's a bit unfair. Whether or not we use the word God in our public life, I think we do have a sense of right and wrong, of justice and injustice. And where the church can contribute, I think, is to look at the resources of our own faith and ask, is there anything that can bridge what seems to be a broken and divided world today. Well, today's Gospel reading is not a morality tale as such, but it is an epiphany tale. This is the second Sunday of Epiphany, after all. An epiphany means revelation. It means a revealing of a great and profound truth. So what does the story of the wedding at Cana reveal? And how can it help us? Well, the first thing this story gives us is a reminder of the simple truth that getting together for a drink is the most natural human thing in the world. The wedding at Cana is a community event to which the whole village has been invited. Now, I believe that because Cana of Galilee was in tier one at the time, Weddings were exempt from restrictions. But joking aside, Mary is there and Jesus and his friends are invited too. All is going with a swing when the wine runs out. 
And unlike central London, there is no convenient shop to which a junior staffer can be dispatched with a suitcase. The wine running out is a problem. Yes, because it would be deeply embarrassing for the host. But more importantly, perhaps, it means that the celebration will have to be curtailed and people's joy restricted. As we've learned to such great cost over the last couple of years, social contact and celebration are vitally important for our mental health and for the cohesion of our communities. And that's why lockdown has been so very, very hard. During those times, we haven't been able to mark those occasions that we really needed to. Now, I don't judge a few civil servants having a bottle of wine after work. But what is so galling is, to so many people, the thought that Boris Johnson's team were setting rules that they had no intention of keeping themselves. It's the hypocrisy that's so hard to live with. And it was precisely this kind of thing uh, for which Jesus called out certain leaders in his day. Religious rulers made ordinary people abide by very strict codes of behaviour, while they themselves lived it up in private. And this kind of hypocrisy, a kind of spiritual double standard, well, it really got Jesus' goat, and he held it under judgment. And it remains true to this day, in fact, that in the kingdom of God, a penitent sinner is always spiritually ahead of a self-righteous saint. But before we mount up on our own high horse and start charging around on it, let's go back to the wedding at Cana. It's worth noticing that Jesus' response to the wine shortage, which could easily have been snooty and moralistic, is not. Jesus doesn't say, oh well, let them drink water, and it serves them right too. He turns the water into wine, saving both the face of the host and the party itself. It's a wonderfully generous act, it seems to me, one that we might do well to ponder. You see, despite all his talk of judgment, Jesus does not demand moral perfection. Rather, he seeks and enables transformation. Jesus doesn't demand moral perfection. He seeks and enables transformation. And so righteous indignation is fine as far as it goes. But what brings real and lasting change is love and self-sacrifice. And that's what we need from our leaders today, the sense that they actually want to be transformed. And it's a worthwhile question for us to ask ourselves too. Getting cross at others, however justified, well, it can easily become a smokescreen for the hypocrisies of our own hearts. And that brings me to the second thing that I think the story teaches us. And it's about invitation. Jesus, we are told, was invited to a wedding. That little detail seems inconsequential, but actually it reflects a deeper mystery. How strange and marvellous that God himself, who holds the universe in his power, how strange that God would need to be invited to anything. And yet, astoundingly, that's what we believe that God chooses to wait for an invitation to come into our lives, just as he did to that wedding. God doesn't force his way in. He waits, so to speak, for our vote of confidence. And when Jesus accepts our invitation to come into our lives, he begins his transformative work. A leader, I think, is one who has heard a similar invitation and chosen to respond. This leader doesn't push himself forward. 
and he might often say in response to high-profile offers, what concern is that to you or me? My hour has not yet come. A leader then who is humble never presumes upon privilege or entitlement, even if she possesses both, but takes the trouble to win the trust of those that she serves. Her Majesty the Queen might be our clearest living example of this. Her inherited status is not altogether unproblematic, but she bears it with remarkable humility and resolve, representing for us, I think, those things that we truly value. If we're going to have a queen, please God, let it be someone like her. Thirdly and lastly, there is the miracle itself, the epiphany moment. If the turning of water into wine is a divine revelation, and what else could it be? then it's an oddly quiet one. As we've noticed, uh, Jesus seems reluctant to push himself forward. And when he does finally intervene, it's perhaps only to please his mother. Always a good idea. But despite the miraculous nature of events, things remain pretty quiet and pretty humble. No one actually sees the transformation take place. Neither the chief steward nor the bridegroom have a clue where the wine has come from. The only ones who are in on the secret are a few measly servants and perhaps a disciple or two peering round the corner of the marquee. In a strange way, it's rather like a replaying of Jesus' birth. The ones who get to witness it are those who happen to be around at the time. Shepherds, servants, ordinary folk. But the miracle is real and it's the best they've ever tasted. We need leaders then who step up and lead by invitation, not ambition. We need leaders who are less inclined to party with the privileged and more inclined to minister with the servants. We need leaders who are less about the grand gesture and more about the quiet miracle. We need leaders who are more concerned with self-sacrifice than self-preservation. The beauty of the Christian faith is that we all actually have the potential to live out this vocation. Christ died for all. His spirit is offered to all. And this means we can all be leaders in our own lives by who we influence and supremely by who we love. Jesus invites you to do so. He commands it even. And if you think that your humble status disqualifies you, then I hope you now see that it's precisely what makes you eligible. If Christ loves you, then how can you demonstrate this love to others this week? Who might you invite to taste and see that the Lord is good? Jesus does not ask for perfection. He enables transformation. This is his glory. And why this disciple still believes in him. Amen.